Hi, everybody. This is Erica Mello, and welcome to episode number 143 of Tough to Treat, a physiotherapist guide to managing those complex patients. And if you are listening to this live when this episode drops, Susan and I want to wish all of you a very, very happy new year. And we hope you had wonderful holidays, and we all look forward to some new adventures with uh, with our podcast this year. So this episode is a two-parter. The next the next part will be airing next week. Okay, so uh, it was just a very long episode, so we decided to break it up into two parts. It's actually a webinar that Susan and I recorded, which comes along with PowerPoint slides. Now you can certainly listen to this episode and next week's episode without these slides, but I think it really would be much more rich. And it will be better just for your clinical reasoning process to, to, to have these slides. So before I forget, and I will mention this a link at the end, uh, to get the slides, go to tough2treat.com forward slash slides. So it's tough2treat.com forward slash slides. And you'll be able to put your name and email and you'll get an immediate download to the slides. And I, I would suggest that if you do that, just follow along with the slides along with the audio. I think it, it'll be a much a much richer experience for you. Either way is fine, but I kind of am a visual person myself. <laughs> anyway, so this is a, a, a webinar that we did calling Increase Your Clinical Expertise by Learning to Assess the Complex Patient, right? So that's sort of right in our wheelhouse. And as I mentioned earlier, it is definitely a two-parter. So we talk about, you know, errors in clinical reasoning, right? How, you know, how can you apply this clinical reasoning to somebody who's had symptoms for, for really quite some time? And what makes a clinical expert, right? What makes somebody an expert? Is it a gut feel? Is it pattern recognition? Or is it this sort of the ability to distinguish between fast and slow thinking as per Daniel Kahneman, right? So I think that uh, I would really listen, uh, listen pretty intently to this piece because there's no right or wrong answer but you really want to be able to apply this fast or slow thinking depending on what your patient needs, right? And what the environment is, right? And it's been shown that the organization and structure of somebody's knowledge, of a clinician's knowledge is much more important than the content itself. So we spend some time on on some advanced clinical reasoning processes. And we talk about red and yellow flags in the webinar. Uh, we also talk about you know some, how to break down movement, right? So if you have somebody who has a problem hitting the golf ball, it's kind of hard to assess the whole golf swing, you know, region by region. You certainly can, but for those of you who have who have a hard time doing that, we talk about how you can break down movement. How you, you know, with someone who's a runner or who's a golfer, how can you break down the movement into different movements or positions that you can that you can assess um, and assess confidently. Right. So I also present a case of a patient of mine who had low, actually two patients who had low back pain, uh, and one you know had a history of a left ankle fracture, the other a rib injury, but they had the same symptoms. How do you apply that clinical reasoning process to figuring out what what their drivers are? And it's really important that that you consider that you consider the the whole body and its connections. And so I would urge you to if you if you if you feel so inclined to download these slides. And once again. It is tough2treat.com forward slash slides, tough2treat.com forward slash slides. And we hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, everybody. I'm Susan Clinton, and I'm here with my co-host, Erica Mello, and we are very excited to bring you our first seminar, which is increasing your clinical expertise by learning to assess the complex patient. In this particular webinar, what we're going to do is we're going to give you some structure on evaluating and treating these difficult cases. Yes, and Susan and I are going to go through, uh, you know, learning, you know, to really find the cause of the problem via some really interesting case studies on some challenging patients that we have treated uh, uh, over the years. Okay, enjoy the webinar. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, clinical expertise, and I sort of love this graphic because it's not a real clinical graphic, but it, it really hones in on what I think, it, it, what makes an expert and how you contribute and add to your clinical expertise. And, you know, what makes people an expert? Is it the ability to critically think or problem solve or analyze? I, I, I personally think it's everything. Um, is it doing the right thing at the right time? Yes. 
I know Mark Jones has done a ton of work on clinical reasoning and everybody has their views on what it is to be an expert, but I really think that, you know, I, I saw a quote recently when I was doing uh, some research for this by Malcolm Gladwell and he said, I'm just gonna actually read it. Often a sign of expertise is knowing what doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting, right? It's, a, it's great because it's like you don't know what you don't know until you realize you don't know it. It's like, I know that seems kind of a backwards way to go, but it's really the truth. And I love the way that this flows because you're just moving back and forth between evaluating, reasoning, analyzing, maybe down to, do I make a decision here? Do I go back up and analyze? Do I come back around and problem solve? If I problem solve, do I go back and evaluate? And, it, you know, you can just keep moving around that spectrum so many ways. And we never really stay in one spot for very long. No. It's all very fluid. I know. And I, when, I, when I saw that quote, I said, how can I actually apply that to, to my patients? And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. But it's, it's just interesting to think. And I think critical thinking is important no matter what profession you're in, to be honest. And I know a lot of us have time constraints and we really can't sit there. And when we have the patient in front of us, really you know, problem solve on a, on a very sort of slow basis, so to speak. But we can do that retrospectively. And I think doing that retrospective review or the chart review is really important. And uh, I saw something else recently. They talk about a clinical sieve or like a clinical funnel. And we often start with a very broad-based, uh, either broad-based uh, you know, analysis, but then we narrow it down by asking the right questions. And I know you're going to talk about mm -hmm. um, your, your, your questions later. So I think that's really important. Uh, it, it's a like a clinical sieve and that word sieve just stuck, it is stuck in my brain. So uh, I think it's, I think it's all of this and I will actually move on to the next slide. So I've had the privilege of actually meeting Daniel Kahneman here in New York and what makes a clinical expert again, is it the gut feel? Is it, you know, is it that slower analytical thinking? And I think that it's both, to be honest, you know? Don't you think so, Susan? I think mm -hmm. it's both. Um, you can't quantify a gut feel. You, always, you know those gut feels that you get when you see patients and you're like, hmm, you know, I, there's something not right, but we can't really put it in as, as evidence, right? It's not evidence-based. Mm -hmm. That's why I do think case studies or that N of one is, is really increasing in value in our profession, in, in my opinion. So I think that pattern recognition also is very important. And we all, we all talk about that. But this fast and slow thinking is, once again, I think very important. And that becoming an expert is knowing when to do it, when to be fast and when to be slow. And I think that's that gut feel piece. Yes. And does the pattern recognition not make sense? Exactly. I don't know. They're having shoulder pain with this and this and this, and you're going to get into a shoulder case in a little bit. But what if it isn't really the shoulder that's the issue? And that's when that gut feel comes in. It's like, what is happening here? What is going on here that isn't fitting that pattern recognition that we've all gathered as clinical experts? Yeah. And I also just wanted to talk about another thing. I agree 100%. And I think that we've often talked about this in the podcast about, about listening and getting this subjective. And I routinely spend 30, even 40 minutes on the subjective with patients. And I think that I challenge anybody who's listening to this to not, you don't need to spend 40 minutes, but after you do the subjective, generate a hypothesis mm -hmm. and try and prove yourself wrong. Exactly. Right. It's like doing research. You want to like have the null hypothesis. <laughs> exactly. So you're going to have, you know, a few regions on your priority list that you want to assess. And they could be the symptomatic area, could be, could be whatever, could be part of a movement, their movement history. But you're going to absolutely try to dis disprove that. And, I, and I, I think that what's also very important, Susan, is that, and I know you're going to talk about this, is a patient tells their story very differently when they just tell their story, like I'll tell them, you know, how can I help you tell me your story versus, you know, what aggravates, what eases, the clinical pattern, the random, I, those are all important, don't get me wrong. But not in the beginning, yeah. Correct, correct. And the patient will, their story will come out vastly different, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a clinical expert, so I, I'll take that back a step. I, the quality I value most in a healthcare practitioner is their ability to listen. And a clinical mm -hmm. expert is a good listener. Yes, absolutely. So, all righty. So I love this. Is your toolbox disorganized? You know, a lot of our toolboxes are disorganized. 
I mean, we have so many treatment techniques. I think the, 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 the idea is knowing when to use them. And, and I think that a lot of people who are very good at clinicians or they, they can assess really well and they have a lot of treatment techniques, but they don't really put it all together. And there's been some research out on, I'm just going to take a quick, uh, Nicole Christensen, Mark Jones, and Judy Carr did a, did a piece on clinical reasoning. And they talk about how the organization here and structure of your knowledge is so much more important than the content. If you think about that, how you organize it in, in your brain. And you can learn from reflection. You can learn by doing a chart review. You know, the trick is doing the right thing at the right time. The right thing at the wrong time doesn't matter. And I'll give you a quick example. You're going to laugh. We actually did a podcast on this guy. He's number podcast episode number seven and eight for anybody who's listening who wants to listen to that particular, those two episodes. He's a patient of mine. He came in, he, you know, felt, twi his chief complaint was I felt twisted. I had headaches. I had neck pain. Make a long story short, what I ended up doing, I did treat, his driver was his neck and he had multiple concussions. He was a judo player. Anyway, I, I treated sort of thorax and above. He came in one day and he's like, you know, I'm thinking of getting orthotics. I want to run again. I wore orthotics for years. I'm like, okay, let's see. So I had him in standing and I said, let me just, you know, take a look at your feet. And I'll, what I did was I basically did what an orthotic would do. So I neutralized his subtalar joint. I gave him a little bit of an arch, just, just very small. I looked up at him. And when I tell you, Susan, his head was turned to the left. His upper trunk was to the right. And he turned to me and he's like, I have a headache. And I was like, you can't mm. wear orthotics. <laughs> So for him, you know, yes, okay, your head turning, your, your upper, you know, th thorax translation, okay, that can be normal for people. But he had a headache. So is that the right thing at the wrong time? That's the wrong thing to do. If mm -hmm. I gave him orthotics or told him he could get orthotics, he would come back a week later and he would have multiple, he'd have headaches. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important, really thinking about your thinking. I really, I really truly believe that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Along with that test retest. So, you know, if anybody is a fan of the Big Bang Theory, fun with flags uh, with Sheldon Cooper. But anyway, one of the things we're going to talk about a little bit is just a real quick clinical reminder about clinical red flags and clinical yellow flags and what those really mean. So your red flags are going to be caution or referral, right? And we have, there's the, the kind of flags that we have that, you know, kind of go along with back pain, which is the radiating pain, numbness, tingling, loss of function, swelling, night pain, all the things you've heard of. But then we kind of look at some other red flags too, with shortness of breath, open wounds, abnormal vital signs. I can't emphasize how important it is to take vital signs on your clients. Mm -hmm. On all of them, because Erica and I have uncovered so many things just by kind of going back and considering, well, what was their, you know, is their heart rate running high? I think we had a podcast on somebody who had heart palpitations at the age of 20. Yes. yes. That have been really like looked at by their physician. Yeah. That's crazy. You know, asking those questions, headaches, um, especially if they're severe and especially if they'll tell you things like, this is the worst headache I've ever had in my life. Take that extremely serious. Um, dizziness, uh, vision changes, these are all cranial nerve things, altered smell, taste, lump in the throat. But then we kind of want to get into some of those sudden change in bowel and bladder. If you ask your clients, have you had changes in bowel and bladder, many of them will say, that they will say no, because why? They've normalized it. I've been constipated my whole life, so it's no change. I've yeah. been leaking since I had my first child. They've normalized it. I'm a pelvic health physical therapist. So to me, that's kind of like, no, no, don't normalize it. But if we ask the question differently, like over the last couple of weeks, have you noticed a huge change in your bowel and bladder? I.e., is it difficult to initiate going to the bathroom or can you not control it? Be, be specific. Go ahead. Legs giving away. That's not a good sign. If <laughs> somebody's walking along and their legs just suddenly give away. And then other signs of strokes and myocardial infarction, which we really don't need to go into on this slide. But when you're dealing with shoulder pain, you better be thinking about when do they have that shoulder pain? Is it after activity or when they're ramping up their cardiovascular activity or is it after eating? You know, what, what's, what's, what's going on here? You know, is it, is it visceral or is it musculoskeletal yeah. what's you know, the lump i'm sorry susan go ahead go ahead no go, go oh, ahead what's, what's the, the the lump in the throat i kind of that's interesting actually to me uh, that's like when they have that real yeah. big kind of difficulty swallowing it feels like they have a lump or a golf ball in their throat 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The no, glossopharyngeal, the lower, the oh, lower right, cranial nerves. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. You don't really, it, it, we learn cranial nerves in school, but you don't realize how important it is, how mm -hmm. really important it is. Yeah. Right? And so anybody who's had accidents and injuries, you, these are things you should uncover. Yeah. You know, yep. you really should. Okay. All right. Yellow flags. So yellow flags are important. And we're going to talk about these in the context of what we're doing today quite a bit, because Erica and I both want to get to the attitudes and the beliefs and the changes of behavior that go along with our clients. So we're going to talk about the questions in a little bit, but it's really important to find out, are they ready for change? Like, how do they feel about what's actually happened to them? And what do they really think is going on? And what's the change of behavior around it? Do they have a big, big fear avoidance? Are they compensating? Or are they actually confronting and not paying attention to their symptoms and just pushing through them? Okay. And then again, just kind of a nice little fluid diagram here that kind of goes along with that clinical reasoning one. We have evaluation, examination, prognosis, intervention, outcome measures. What do they tell us? I know a lot of people get really um, uh, fatigued in the clinic with giving out questionnaires. And a lot of it is that they're not paying attention to what those questionnaires are actually telling us. Because mm -hmm. there's some good information inside of there. It's not just adding up the numbers and saying, here they are, and there's a meaning, meaningful clinical you know, difference. But really take a look inside of them. Is there a pain perception problem? Is there a fear problem? Is there a danger or harm? What words are being used? And what about functional movement problems? A lot of those questionnaires have some really good information about sitting and reading and looking at the computer if somebody's got neck or shoulder pain or yeah. sitting and driving if they've got back pain you know so you can really kind of begin to find out how long does it take for that to come on and you can get some good measures from there yeah for sure mm -hmm. and then we want to think about which ones in this context of the complex patient that we're talking about today because of course there's a hundred of them they can go for all of the different ones and i'm not going to put them out there you know like the dash for the arm and the and the shoulder and you know the other ones but um let's think about what's going to be our biggest bang for our buck for these very complex patients so i love the central sensitization inventory the depression anxiety stress scale mm. a pain cata catastrophization scale one of the big golden ones out there still to this day is the fear avoidance belief questionnaire yeah. And it's got a, it's got a um, you know, regular activity and it's got a work activity one that can tell you a little bit about work and if work is bothering them and they're afraid to be at work, which can match up, match up with, the D, with the DAS pretty well. Yeah. Tampa kinesiophobia scale can tell you how afraid they are to move. And the Oswestry has some great functional movement problems in there. Yeah. What about lying down? What about moving? And what about getting up? What about, you know, the old Oswestry even had sex, pain with sex. Yes, that's right. I, I love that central sensitization one. It's, it's mm -hmm. a good one. I am actually not familiar with that one. So, uh, I mean, yeah, I have a patient right now who's like significant anxiety and I, I, my gosh, I think I was mm -hmm. actually going to do that with him. So yeah, it's really nice because it's got a part yeah. one and a part two. So it's got oh. some, some, it asks some questions in some different ways, which makes it really well. All of these are open access. You can go yeah. in and, uh, Google them, find them, pull the forms up. My only thing about outcome measure questionnaires like this is don't put the title on there. <laughs> don't hand somebody a, a questionnaire to fill out that says fear avoidance belief questionnaire. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to help. No. Then are they going to look at Tampa kinesiophobia? <laughs> what? You know, so just kind of just say, oh, just yeah. answer these questions. I put like TKS, FABQ, PCS, DAS, CSA. They don't know what that means. Well, what if they ask you? What do you say? <laughs> well, I, I usually send that out to them ahead of time. Oh, got you know? it. So, yeah. but you know, if they, when they come in, we talk about it and I'll say, well, look, yeah. Here's what central sensitization actually means. Yeah. And you scored pretty high on this. And so what this is telling me is that we've got a, probably a sensitive nervous system that we're dealing with here yeah. on yeah. top of the pain that you're having in this region. So I never discount what they're saying. I just talk about this is giving us some good information mm. to really look at them in much more of a holistic way yes. and to kind of realize that, okay, this person is really afraid of movement. How am I going to help get them going um, and not be the threat that they're trying to protect against. Yeah, and actually these are amazing because there are some patients, even you could be the best, you know, 
clinician or the, an expert and try to get the patient to tell you something and they won't tell you anything mm -hmm. until five visits. Oh yeah, this bothered me or this. And I think this is, uh, I admittedly don't use these as often as I should. So I, I will, I will much more now for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Alrighty. And so uh, getting to those questions. So first listen to their story. Listen, listen, listen. Don't interrupt. Listen, ask maybe a little curiosity uh, clarification you know, as you go along to get more out, like they mentioned something else and then they don't come back to it, you might go clarify that little other piece you were talking about a little bit more. Do it from a curiosity standpoint, but let them really get their story out because you're going to get, like Erica said earlier, the amount of information you gain from that story is priceless. Yes, yes. And then if this didn't come out, I, or sometimes I may even answer this with the story they told me, um, but these are questions mm -hmm. that I think are so important. What do you think or believe is going on? How did this happen? I want to get, there's that back to that we were talking about in yellow flags. What are their beliefs? Yeah. What are their beliefs around this? Yeah. What are your expectations about management? What does a successful mm -hmm. outcome look like? So I may not answer it, ask it that way, but right. what do you expect to change with your treatment yes. with me? Where do you want to go? Now we're getting at their vision. Right. We got to so, align this with their vision. I want to return to running marathons. Yes. That's important for me to know. Yes. Um, I want to be able to jump on the trampoline with my children and not wet my pants. You know, what is it that they're really after? What does that vision look like for them? Because everything you do needs to align to that client vision or it's going to be meaningless to them. Yeah. And then the final one, of course, which is my, my favorite, because this is where you really, really, really find some of the, the really important things, is what concerns you the most about this? And I usually say it this way. I have it written down here deep down. What are you worried about? I usually say in your heart of hearts, what are you the most seriously worried about with this? And that's when you really get the uncovering of the deeper fears about what may be happening with them. And it's generally nothing in the short term. It's generally kind of a long term, like if this doesn't get better, I'm not going to be a good mover and I'm going to end up getting sick and living in a nursing home. I, you'll be, if you be quiet and let them answer this question, you'll be really amazed at what they come out with. But that can help you so much because if you can help them understand that, that doesn't have to be the outcome, that that vision question is the outcome that they're looking for, then you can start to use language like, you want to get better because you want to be a better mover so that you can jump on the trampoline and play with your kids and not leak. And therefore that, that way you're not going to end up in the nursing home like you're afraid of, right. you know, so you can, you know, so you're, they, that way they know you have their story. Yes. And it's really that's, important. Yeah. And I also think that that's part of that whole person approach, the whole person, it, it, you know, whole body, whole person. You need to know, I mean, you've got their fears, their, their, their joys. You know, a lot of patients will say, I just want to get rid of my pain. And I'm like, well, of course you do. But, you know, is there something that you can't do that you want to be able to do or mm -hmm. some, something like that? And uh, it, it, I love that last question because it really gets down to the really nitty gritty of what's driving these patients. And the more persistent these patients are, they're going to have concerns and they're gonna, they're, there's something else in there that's driving a lot of their mm -hmm. symptoms. Uh, so I, I just love this. I love these questions. Okay. So we want to think about with those questions, where are they stuck? And so some of my clients have come in saying, you know, being very almost, almost depressed about it. Mm -hmm. Like this has been going on for so long. I'm never, I, I, I don't know what to do about it. It's always going to be this way. I don't even know why I'm here. My wife told me to come here. My husband told me to come here. Yeah. Um, you know, so that means that that somebody's, those people are in that pre-contemplative uh, phase. That means they don't even, they don't even know that they should be like thinking about getting better. They're just stuck. I've been constipated my whole life. I've had back pain for 40 years. Let's move on. It's like, well, wait, <laughs> let's find out about this back pain for 40 years and this constipation for your whole life. That can change. Mm -hmm. But what, it, how, you know, and, and what in their story is telling you that they're contemplative and they're ready to take action. And because that's the kind of thing that we want to do is we need to really move these people into that take action thing and understanding their vision and understanding their fears can lead you a long way to getting there. Their fears are holding them back. 
-hmm. more than they're spurring them forward. And, uh, but their vision, that's where you can latch on to say, you want to run a marathon. That's fantastic. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. And now let's figure out how we can get you on the road to returning to be that marathon runner that you want to be. And so now they're kind of, kind of thinking, okay, what's my next step? Rather than, well, I can't run 500 miles, so I'm not going to run at all, which is pre-contemplative, right? Like, right, right. if I can't run a marathon, then why run? Mm. But now they weren't looking at, oh, but those action steps, so walking five miles is going to be the first step to getting me to run in a marathon. So Got we're it. aligning that vision together. And then I want to just point this out here. I know a lot has been written and a lot have been say, said, but please avoid words and attitudes that have not been shown to be helpful. Do not use words like disabled. Do not yeah. use words like chronic. And for goodness sake, do not use words like instability. Mm -hmm. Change your language. Talk about coordination. Talk about motor control. Talk about muscle switching on and off. Talk about the nervous system being sensitive. Mm -hmm. But the words like damage and chronic and instability. Or, or stuck. Just, just, stuck. Yeah, stuck. Or stuck. Right. We got to <laughs> unstick your joints. You know, <laughs> you know, things like that. Please don't do that, especially in these people who are really um, having a struggle with. Uh, um, catastrophization and fear of movement and mm -hmm. and some of the other deeper beliefs about movement that they've kind of been fed so yeah. I just wanted to kind of throw that in there that'll help you with complex patients because they're all thinking those words don't mirror those words to them you yes. know find different ways to talk to them about how they are that will move them on that contemplative take action phase and not keep them in that pre-contemplative phase yeah, and so how do you like if you were to give somebody one piece of advice to get them from pre-contemplative to contemplated, ha contemplative, excuse me, how would you, how would you do that? Would you have them move or talk to them? I'm, you know, I'm just curious. So if we're in the, if we're in the subjective part, yep. that, that's those questions that I ask or my ways of trying ah. to get them to do that. And it's like, how, li right. how confident are you that you feel like you could go out and run that marathon mm -hmm. without getting help for this? And on a scale of one to 10, and oftentimes if they're very pre-contemplative, they're going to be very low, you know, and Got it's it. like, well, okay, so you're a four. Mm -hmm. you think you can figure it out, but you're still not real sure how. How can we make that a seven? Mm, okay. And then that's when they can kind of come up with, well, I, you know, then they have to kind of come up with what it is that they need. And that's begin to, to help you formulate your intervention. Like, okay, well, I need to learn how to be able to run without this pain. Bingo. Now we're contemplative. Hmm, how would I do that? <laughs> Enter Erica or Susan <laughs> right, right. or whoever else is out there. Got you it. know, now you've got the door to walk through and say, let's work on this together. Let's start to think about those first action steps because the ultimate goal is to do that for you. Right. And you know, it's funny if people come in and say, you know, massage makes me worse. Uh, I'm cold all the time. Or I've been to, I've been to eight therapists and no one has helped me. Okay, it's, if you've been to eight therapists and no one has helped you, it's not the therapists. You've been right. to eight people, okay? So you need to, it's a belief system on the part of the patient. And, you know, the massage makes me worse. Okay, an, an, an expert would not sit there and, you know, pivums and pavums and soft tissue. You need to assess movement actively, you know? And, 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 and I think that, you know, that's a good way to sort of, you know, mm -hmm. do, take that whole person, uh, that whole person approach as well. So, I yeah. And that's that, that's that expected outcomes. Ah, uh, right. You know, what, what do you, you know, because sometimes they have a, um, what I like to call kind of a, a, a conflict. And I know I, this bothers me, but I think I have to do it to get better. Yes. You know, yes, so right. I want you to do this stuff, even though I don't do well with it. If I don't have it, then I'll be, I'm not going to get better. Right. And it's like having to, bring that around to another way it's like what if we tried a different you know because we know how this the outcome is on this one mm -hmm. and i hear you on that and i understand where that you know where that belief is coming from that you know no pain no gain or you just have to do this and get through it and i said but what if we can figure out a couple of other things before we go into that mm -hmm. and that's when we can start with that movement piece that you're gonna you're gonna start taking yeah. us through here i think in a minute or two right 
I believe so. Yes. Yep. Here we go. So this is just a case example. So <laughs> when I say example, I just do a quick brief case example. And our longer case studies are, 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 are going to be later. But uh, I, the purpose of this slide is really just so you can streamline your clinical reasoning process and just really uh, consider the whole, the whole person or, or the whole body connections. And, and these are patients of mine who uh, they both had, actually, they came in almost in the same week, it was weird. They both had low back pain. One had a you know significant movement history of you know an old ankle fracture years ago, and the other uh, a more more recent uh, a rib injury. And the second guy actually had some uh, office changes. He changed jobs. So he had ergonomic changes as well. So, I I don't. I mean, I believe in you know with patients who have low back pain. I understand we need to do all the cardinal planes of movement, and you know. Low, forward bend, back bend, side, but I don't do those as much anymore, and I understand that we, you need to do them. But I think from uh, the patient perspective, you need to assess a, move, a movement that's meaningful. And I think that you, how do you sit? You squat, you get to a seated position from a squat. So in these patients, it's important to assess the movement that's meaningful. So when I assess these guys, they both shifted their body weight to the right. Maybe normal, maybe re not relevant, relevant, who knows, right? However, they it reproduced their symptoms. So I had to give them a better movement strategy or give their system better choices. So ultimately what I did, what I, I'm not gonna describe the whole eval here, but basically the guy who had the left ankle fracture, he, he had it years ago. He just offloaded that, that left leg forever. It was a learned movement pattern and he just never, got was able to get out of it and i think that it's really important when we see patients we take the patients and i'll talk about this later right to the end i mean they may be pain free but if they're still walking on that left side they're eventually depending how much load they is gonna you know in their system or depending on what type of sport they play or or not they may come back with a different problem or the same problem so i do believe that you need to take into account past medical issues and so on the first guy i actually did treat his foot Okay, and uh, he got significantly better. And I will tell you from a percentage standpoint, 80% of his treatment was his foot. Secondary, I did a little bit on his back just because I think patients sometimes, even if they've had persistent issues and their backs have been treated, they want to be felt, right? They want to be felt. So that's, that's uh, the expected outcome that he probably uh, uncovered. His back was important to him. In order for his back to feel better, he needed to move differently. Correct. You treated, helped his foot learn a different way to move, and it shifted his body weight, but you still went back to his back because it was an expected outcome. Like, she's going to do something. She's going to work with my back in some way. And then you were doing it in a meaningful activity because it was causing him pain. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the same thing with the other guy. I actually worked on his trunk control. And just like one thing that I know a lot of people, especially who, you know, you, you tell the patient, you know, what, what, you know, or the patient asks you, what makes you so different? And, and a lot of people say, I treat the whole body. Okay. Every lot, most people, I mean, we all treat the whole body, right? Uh, I think a lot of people will treat, have an impairment based model. They'll treat impairments. If someone comes in with back, knee, you know, a foot issue, and you're going to treat all three body parts. No, you're not. That's really an impairment-based model. And I think in order to treat and to grow your, you know, improve your clinical reasoning process and grow your clinical expertise, you know, you need to, and this is what I say to patients, I actually try to find, you know, I don't actually treat your impairments. I try to find one or two key influences or drivers that are gonna make the most long lasting change to your body. So if I have to treat your foot for your hip pain, then I will do it. So those impairment based models don't really treat the whole person. And that's why I said consider the whole body connections. You need to find one region of the body to intervene in. At the end of the day, we're changing brain maps, we're changing neurophysiological out input or out and output. So you need to assess those relationships. And with these patients, the most bang for my buck was not their back. But once again, as Susan mentioned, I needed to treat that a little bit. You know, this is the whole person we're talking about, not just you know, treating the symptomatic body, body part. Alrighty, I will move on. Okay, so these, I've got a series of three slides with this girl. Um, I'd be curious to see, Susan, what you think of this. I, I, I got so into doing, uh, playing with my preview on my, my Mac, drawing me these lines. And so this is a series of three slides. 
When I have a patient who tells me they have a problem in standing, that's it, I can't stand. I'm looking at standing, that's an issue. You need to look at them stand. If a person says I can't sit, I'll look at standing a little bit. I kind of need to know where they start. But if they move out of that, out of this posture and they move be well or better, this is not relevant. So I would urge you, at least in the virtual setting or when actually you go back, I would do it both, to take screenshots of your patients in you know, standing. Uh, I'll talk about the, the, I do it narrow base. This is a normal base and a wide base. I would urge you to take pictures of your patient standing in a narrow, normal, wide base and to squat narrow, normal, wide in the clinic as well. You know, take it with your phone, move on, put it down, and then look at it later. And I have found that to be very helpful for me personally, at least in the virtual setting. So with this particular girl, I mean, you can see, right? I mean, she's got this whole translation of her left up in her thorax and her head, and it's a bit biomechanical, so bear with me. And she looks pretty okay through here, but she's, this girl had no pain. I mean, this was a, a, somebody I know, she had a little bit of a hip issue. She's not a patient of mine. Okay, when she squatted, normal base of support, I think she looks better. Don't you, Susan? I mean, she looks okay. Doesn't look bad. You know, why? <laughs> why? So I, it's just, you know, to me, it starts to become <laughs> that issue of load transfer. You know, when she begins to load transfer and she moves further into, what's interesting with her, though, is moving further into flexion at her hips. Yep. She really isn't changing her lumbar spine at all. She's staying fairly extended in her lumbar spine. Uh, right in through here, you mean, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, but her thorax is shifting, and it's mainly because, you know, what's happening is she just, like, load transferring over onto that right foot a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Don't know. We'd have yeah, to match it up with all the other pieces. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, you can make a hypothesis also. She's got a little bit of a rigidity in her left foot. I know her, so I, you know, I have a... But, and she just actually, in order to make herself squat better, she just shifted her weight over to offload the foot. Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. She definitely looks better for sure. Okay. Okay. This is a very narrow base. So it doesn't look bad, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think she looks pretty good. Usually when I had assess patients like this in a narrow base, they kind of look worse. She yeah. looks much better. And I'm just sitting here thinking, why is she much better? You know, I don't know. She's. She, she definitely looks better. I think from an, a, a clinical reasoning standpoint, uh, the things that don't, you know, once again, no one is, there's no normal. It's what's optimal for the patient and what's optimal for the patient is different for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're just looking at pictures here and we are, and, and, and we don't know that her story or anything, but uh, I think it's just interesting for me uh, to look and, and, you know, this looks pretty okay. This looks good. Still a bit, you know, mm -hmm. translated here, but you know what? If she said, I, I can't, I, I can't, I can't sit. And, you know, I'm like, well, this looks pretty good. And if we had, you know, back through here, you know, this looks better than this. So if you want to train somebody who has a problem sitting, I would train her with more of a narrow base to start with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that would be more that little, that little clinical, clinical reasoning piece. And once again, I urge you to all take your screenshot. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Uh, and this is more the wide base. And, and, you know, I think that sort of falls into the middle of the same thing. The, the most, she can adapt a bit better here uh, with this wide base at the feet. And, and the, the thing that I noticed the most that's been the most, was the most consistent was this, th this, you know, and this, and mm -hmm. uh, this does get better. Uh, you know, I'll just, so we, that's pretty much, that's pretty standard, uh, pretty consistent. Looks much better there and standing a little bit off. But once again, you know, mm -hmm. we don't know her story. Uh, yeah. And same thing. You yeah, know, when we could, we could hypothesize a lot of stuff. Is she carrying exactly. her baby on her left side? Totally. Yep. Does she carry her purse and her bag and her umbrella and all of her stuff to get on the New York subway on one side? Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. that the right side is the opening the door and doing that. I don't know. We don't. And it's you interesting. Know? Because she, uh, was, we were shooting a series of, of, of videos and photos, and uh, she's, you know, I, I showed her this, and she was like, oh, you know, not being, a, you know, a, 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 she was made aware of certain movement patterns, and mm -hmm. once again, this wasn't meaningful for her. She mm -hmm. didn't have any issues, yeah. nothing, not meaningful. Why change it? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I just threw these in there because I thought it was interesting. And I urge you guys in the clinic just to just to take two seconds, even virtually, virtually much more for me. It's helped me a lot, a lot, to, a lot to do something like this. 
So I'm not going to read through all of these, these bullet points, but you're going to see a lot of people who have, for, not just for, you know, complex patients or tough to treat patients, but you're, you know, even more of your acute patients are going to have s s some of these issues and they're going to have random aches and pains. They may have a high degree of anxiety, but I wanted to mention this positions that require, where are we, that require lengthening. And uh, a couple examples, I have a patient who's had a chronic hip problem or a persistent hip problem and she, I would have her on the table supine and I would, I would be, you know, working on, on, uh, let's say her, her hip or a, she had an, a secondary neck issue. And all of a sudden when I am, you know, doing some work on her neck, work manual therapy on her neck, and I have her just sort of straighten her, do a heel slide to, to do some dynamic release. All of a sudden I'll feel her head shrinking like a turtle goes in the shell. So as you're doing a heel slide and you're flexing, I'm at the table and I'm like, oh my God, my head is like going down to the end of the table because that's, that's a lengthening. That's a lengthening. Something in that lower extremity doesn't like to be lengthened. So those are your, I don't even want to use the word dural, but those are your really complex nervous systems. Something doesn't like it, right, Susan? So I, 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 that's an important bullet point for me. And, and I also had another patient uh, she had a, uh, actually a low back issue. This was more of an acute issue. And all of a sudden I see her right foot starting to invert on the table. She's like, it always does that. I'm like, it does. <laughs> because she does, doesn't, there's something in their system that it need, it needs, they're, they're shortening something because their nervous system doesn't like length. So I think, you know, out of all these bullet points, this is for me is certainly the, the more, more interesting one. Do you have any comments on this, Susan? Or should I yeah, the, you know, the thing about the positions that require lengthening, I think that gets into with moving over to the left-hand side with the central nervous system, central sensitization, um, even mm. history of concussion, long hist in injury histories. What we're talking about is nerves are not being, are, are not mobile anymore. And maybe even the cardiovascular system isn't as mobile as it should be for lengthening and shortening. Because remember that like you, Erica's favorite words are the, you know, nerves are blood suckers. And so mm -hmm. they need to move. And sometimes they just, you know, the tissue changes and they're not as mobile as they used to be. And, um, and maybe because they're starting to be pulled, the cardiovascular system isn't as mobile either. And so there's a tendency for the brain to protect and like, oh no, we're not going to go into that again. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I agree. But I do see that a lot. I see it more with lengthening than I do with shortening for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, and then again, you know, when we're talking about blotchy, that's just skin changes and that can be autonomic nervous system, you know, like uh, into the skin, you know, it could be the nervous system into the skin. It could be the, the cardiovascular system into the skin as well. So, Yep. Your skin can yep. be a nice reflection of what's going on on, on the inside, particularly around the peripheral nerves. Um, yeah. If you've got blotchy skin changes, all dry skin, different kinds of things that are going on, itchy patches, eczema, those can all be signs of a nervous system that may be uh, not as healthy and mobile as it should be. Yeah, it's interesting. I also um, didn't put up here, but you know, sweating. I find a lot of patients who have just mm -hmm. that sympathetic uptick. Um, yeah. And also, you know, people who don't like taping. I mean, I tape a fair bit, and there I've noticed a, a I guess a, I don't know for lack of a better word, people who are very sensitive. Tape falls off. They don't like it. Uh, it doesn't help. They've just got really skin or issues with their skin or just. Um, they're very sensitive on this, and that's something I found much more recently. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is also just another clinical example. <laughs> and once again, also to really consider the connections. And I, this patient, actually, we did a podcast on him, um, podcast number 60, 60. And he's a patient of mine who had, I've treated him on and off over the years, he recently had his third child and he has two daughters and, and a son and he was helping out his wife. Uh, she had a very uh, difficult birth on the third one. And so he was really helping her, um, you know, carry the baby, lift the baby. And he had a lot of right hip pain and he had a lot of back pain over the years. And he just, his main issue was he couldn't stand. He couldn't stand and hold the baby and he couldn't walk. So he could sit fine. And, you know, once again, especially uh, when you're under load and stress, the body is going to take the path of least resistance. And he really, he wouldn't have come into me if he had a problem walking, 
correctly said, is when he started to hold his baby. And we often think about mothers with their babies, but I think that, you know, fathers are important too, <laughs> right? You know, so he had the, the, the issue. And so I think people, when they come in to see us there, they, and I put this, what is their strategy? We need to change their strategy. I mean, he obviously didn't have a, an optimal strategy for him in holding his baby. So what I did was, and you, do you, you know, treat his back and his hip and hope for the best? No, no, you don't. Um, and his past m movement history is, you know, he had uh, ACLs on both knees and he had bilateral ankle issues. He, he had a lot, if you listen to the podcast, he had a lot of motor control issues and he had some inflammatory issues as well. So I think with him, what I ended up, what I really wanted to, to, to the reason why I wanted to put him in is I took a look at him in standing because standing was meaningful for him. Okay. Did I look at him walking? Yes, I did. So when I took a look at him walking in that step forward, some people listening to, to, the, to this may not feel comfortable assessing a step forward task. You need to do what's comfortable at your clinical skill level. If you have a hard time assessing a step forward movement, do one legged standing, you know, do, do something that you're comfortable with. So I'm comfortable assessing a step forward. So when I did, he had this whole lateral, right lateral translation or right, you know, center of mass over base of support way over to the right, putting all of his weight on the outside border of his right foot, that right hip translated to the left, almost like straining that, 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 that trochanteric bursa. And he had symptoms and he had symptoms. So because I know his, I know his history, I, I, I did go into his foot and I went into to, to sort of give, it, give him some support. I, for, for the purposes of, of, of this presentation, I really ended up doing, uh, just neutralizing his rear foot and I had, him, I had him step forward again. And I know it's hard to, you know, when you do that, you, the person's taking their foot off the ground. So I just did, did, did a quick taping um, to simulate what I had done and he felt significantly better. So when I altered the movement at his foot, it altered his hip pain. And this is this whole body connections. He, I gave him a new brain map. I gave him a new strategy. And I assessed him in standing. And my experience has been that the driving influence or the driver is consistent across different tasks. Depending on how you load them, you will have secondary issues. And I know we talked about this um, on a podcast recently with one of my patients. When you, they start to load the system a bit more, secondary issues will, will come up. So I assessed him in standing. He didn't have his baby with him. I had him just hold a weight in his hand. And the minute he held the weight, he went right over to the right side. Path of least resistance, easy. I'm not going to change my strategy when I've got a crying baby in my arms, right, Susan? <laughs> You know, you can't change, he's not going to do it. So what I basically gave him was, I, I gave him some short treatment on, on his feet uh, and he didn't come in that much because he's not local to me. So I, I gave him a ball release on his foot. Uh, I, I taught his wife uh, how, how actually how to tape his foot and I gave him some, some, some control, some, some movement control for his foot. And I said, when you're holding the baby, practice that, <laughs> practice that. And he did. And he was uh, actually significantly better. And I will tell you, in, in this scenario, his back, I did treat secondarily because the more the baby grew, he needed some trunk control. So I think that as you know, to the clinical reasoning process, we need to change, our clinical reasoning is always evolving. And I think we need to sort of think about, okay, well now this is bothering him. Is it the same driver or is it something else? And so that's why I wanted, I wanted to mention him because he definitely had motor control issues, but his main issue was was his foot. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments on that, Susan? Or should yeah, I? Yeah, just just going around that fluid circle of okay, so now he's here, and the foot and everything is moving much better, but now he needs some trunk control, trunk coordination, uh, some stuff for his trunk to be able to handle the challenges of not just the weight on one side, but a moving weight on one yeah. side. Yeah. And this is very important. And so uh, you also brought it in where when he's in the position where it hurts, that's when he needs to change. And he was with it enough to, to make that happen. You know, again, he was ready for action. Yeah. yeah exactly. He wasn't pre-contemplative hanging back there going, why is she treating my foot? You right. know, you'd moved him along the continuum and he knew why. And he knew that if he did this with his foot while he's holding the baby, it would make his pain less. And he tried it, he retested it, he tested it. And then he realized when my back hurts, this is what I do. Yes. 
Yes. And it got better. And then as he got better with that, it was like, okay, now I need, you know, I need something different. Yeah. This isn't the same anymore. I'm right. able to do this on my foot. I'm shifting. I'm doing all of that. But now what about this part? So then he went up and got into his back and his trunk and said, okay, let's take a look at the rest of it. Yeah. And I think it's not I... just one thing. It's always like, okay, so now that part's better. Let's see what's starting to happen now. And the baby's growing. So yes, the weight's exactly. different. Mm -hmm. Things are changing. Things are changing. Mm -hmm. And I often tell patients, if they say to me, why are you working up my foot? Or why am I, or I explain to them what I'm doing. And I say, I'm basically, I'm doing what your muscles, you know, uh, I'm, I'm taking the place of what your muscles should be doing, or I'm giving you some support, whatever mm -hmm. resonates to them. I'm not going to sit there and say, I'm optimizing the neuromuscular forces across your foot, you know, <laughs> so, but that's what I'm doing. But I'm, they're not mm -hmm. going to understand that, obviously. So, and they get that. I'm, supplying, I'm providing support. I'm providing it, uh, you know, I'm doing what your muscles should be doing. So I think mm -hmm. that, and that and he and he got that because he, uh, he's been a patient of mine for a while so um i love this this girl jumping ropes you hear that foot can you imagine landing on that foot every time when she jumps a rope um i'll be brief on this slide but it, ultimately we're patients and i will put myself in this i'll give you we're trying to give patients better strategies and and i've had multiple injuries you know ironically i've had more injuries as a physical therapist than i had when i was working on wall street and i and and i had different injuries when i was sitting so uh and i'm very hypermobile and hypermobile people can compensate until they run out of options and and we can and and we have many choices for movement because we are flexible mm -hmm. but patients ultimately they will reach a air quotes buckle point. It's not like anything is buckling, but there's something in their system that's that's causing them to come into your office. It doesn't necessarily have to be pain. It could be loss of power, fatigue, leaking. Um, you know, just 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 general loss of power if they're weightlifting. It doesn't have to be pain. Mm -hmm. So you really need to think about changing their movement strategy and once you know I said this before, but a healthy system makes really good choices for movement and when your patient doesn't make a good choice for movement if they can compensate somewhere else they will like i do i'll just move my foot or i'll do whatever mm -hmm. until until we can't so this particular patient um i actually did this guy virtually i love golf so i just put this golfer in he was more of of, of an acute an acute issue but he uh had some right quadratus uh, ql pain here right low back pain and he played golf on and off for a long time. He had his symptoms on and off for years. Never sought help for it. He got better. And then all of a sudden, he started playing more golf. And then he started to jump rope. So his environment changed. And he, the first thing he said to me, Susan, this is a virtual assessment. It all started with the jumping rope. So when someone says that to me, I'm like, that's important. I believe that. Per Before I even interviewed this guy, I knew that was going to be the issue. <laughs> So I said, well, how do you jump rope and, and, and you, you squat? So I, my go-to is the squat and I do that with a lot of patients. So when I had him squat, he literally, and I showed him this, I screenshot, he literally shifted his weight. Once again, weight shift. Is it, he shifted his weight to his right side, his symptomatic side. He said, every time I land, it just gets me on that right side. So he had an issue with his left foot. I know I talk a lot about the foot. Um, I'm doing it purposely, but he had an issue with his rigid, his rigid left, rigid foot. And he just lost his ability to adapt to jumping. So when he jumped, he shot his weight over to the right side, caused the, 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 the sort of on concrete, mind you. Because he said to me, you know, I jump rope in the city here and it's on a, a mat and I feel okay. I'm like, well, you can sh absorb shock a bit better on a mat. When he did it on the concrete, he could not. And every time he landed, he went over to his right side. So ultimately, did I tell him to you know, try to self-release this? Yes, because it was an acute issue at the time. I did. I said, you need to self-release this. I gave him some treatment techniques to do on his own. I said, but, and if he literally went away and never jump roped again, he'd be fine, I think. But he wanted to jump rope. This was meaningful for him. He needed to jump rope because he wasn't working with his trainer. So we, we talked about him, you know, uh, releasing some of the muscles in the bottom of his foot. I gave him some foot control. I gave him calf stretches. So I gave him a better choice for movement. And I think that's the motto here is giving our patients better movement choices or, or multiple, multiple choices, right? It's creating new brain maps. We need choices in our brains. All right. And I'm going to go through this real quickly. And I talked about breaking down movement patterns. So this is really hard to assess. So uh, 
you know, you need to check rotation here. If, if, you, if you find this difficult to assess in the clinic, which I do, uh, I break it down. You can definitely, you need thoracic rotation. I do this in sitting um, and in, in virtual, I have them kneel a little bit um, to get on a fixed pelvis. I'll have them do that in a virtual setting. Um, you can have them do a weight shift here or do, just do a quick um, lunge to see how they weight shift. And then you can look at standing because if this guy says my knee hurts when I hit the ball, Golfing is a standing sport, so you need, to, you need to look at this. And this is just a mirror image of the girl that we looked at earlier. So this is how you would break down, break down that pattern. Same thing here. She's a runner. You need, to, you need rotation. Uh, and you, know, you, can, if you, you can assess her on one leg here. You can also have her do a front lunge or do these arrows because it's sort of mimicking the movement pattern. And I like to assess lunges in runners. So if you can't, and this is hard to assess, so you break, the point is breaking that movement pattern down into more manageable assessment uh, tools for yourself. Here we go. Okay, so the next part of this is just going to be us running through a couple of case, uh, case studies here. Um, so this, this client uh, was, 30, was 30 years old, uh, pregnant with first baby 11 weeks. Um, uncomplicated healthy pregnancy. Uh, progressive pain in the back of my pelvis on the left side started at four weeks after sitting or bending over at work and is now progressing to instability, I'm sorry, to inability to sit on the floor and work. All right, so she was having pain on the back side of her pelvis on the left side, um, it, bending over at work and inability to sit on the floor at work is when she's having the biggest problem. Uh, she had a labral tear repair and a psoas tendon release with a good recovery and was back to all activities prior to her pregnancy. So that was just kind of the only uh, past history she gave at the time. Okay. So other factors to consider, we need to like look at the whole picture here, right? Not just at the musculoskeletal. Okay, well, I need to like mobilize her pelvis or, you know, fiddle with the hip or the back. But let's take a look at everything. Um, especially because of that work piece. Yeah. She works as a pelvic health PT. She's in a busy clinic. She works 40 hours a week. She gets on and off the floor to take care of lower extremity lymphedema clients. For those of you who don't understand what that means, there's a lot of massage and there's a lot of wrapping, uh, you know, and it's compression bandaging that goes on. And a lot of people choose to sit on the floor and have their client's legs dangling off the table to take care of them. She expresses worry about her job requirements. This is huge. Yeah. And on the FABQ uh, work part, I can tell you she, uh, that she, she didn't score well on that. Mm. You know, she felt like work was going to be harmful to her. Wow. Um, she was unable to exercise due to pain, uh, which is a big deal for her. She wasn't doing the things that she wanted to do. And then she said she started with some urgency, urinary urgency at nighttime. So she's up two nights a, a week. I mean, two, two times a night. She's only 30. <laughs> She's up oh, two wow. times a night. Able to hold her urine all day without voiding at work. This is a pelvic health PT. This is the, the silos we get ourselves stuck in when we're really super busy. And she wasn't thinking about any of her own stuff that she teaches her own clients all the time. You can't go eight to 10 hours and not go to the bathroom. Oh, boy. That is not healthy. And it's recreating urgency now at nighttime because she's avoiding drinking all day. So when she gets home, she's drinking. And then, of course, when she lays down, then her kidneys are having to deal with it. So that's an issue. She's not sleeping. She's worried about work. She's not sleeping and she's not exercising. Wow. wow. The symptom expression is this pain, right? Yeah. Nutrition. Yeah. She's trying to eat healthy, but she's not hungry in the morning on the three early days that she has to go into work. She, mm -hmm. she grabs protein bars for snacks and eats lunch on the run and does not take a lunch break. There's, talk about self-care <laughs> right there's no way to power yourself through if you don't eat lunch eats a healthy dinner that she cooks on three days but has leftovers on the other two because she works late on two days and works early on three days so yeah. Yeah. Um, her sleep is interrupted uh, very fatigued when the weekend comes um, underneath joy she's excited about being a mother I love reading uh, lots of information about it but I really 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 love exercise and I'm not able to do that now I love the joy. I really like that. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think we do that often enough with patients. I like mm -hmm. that. You know, it's really important. Yep. Because really it's a ways to pull things in yeah. that can be meaningful to them, you know? Yeah, so she's excited about being a mother. Pregnancy isn't scaring her. Work is scaring her. 
She's yeah. not taking care of herself at work. She's not taking care of herself at work. And that way, and that means that she doesn't have the time and she doesn't feel good enough to exercise. So these, these are problems here. Yeah, you can sure. also start to kind of see like how, you know, is this a, yes, she has back pain, but maybe it's because the pregnancy, I don't, you know, and it's not because she's pregnant. It's because maybe the brain is protecting this area and it protected that left hip before. Mm -hmm. And so she's kind of worried. Yeah. Who knows? I don't know. That just is just her story. So we're getting it to come out here. Yeah, interesting. All right. So her three powerful questions. What do you think is going on? I think the hip labral tear and repair so as lengthening procedure didn't have enough time to get well. My pelvic pain is a result of the instability from pregnancy with posterior rotation. This is the belief system. Mm. Okay, uh, work is a huge issue because of the movements of bending over and sitting on the floor has caused this all to start up. All right. Yep. See those words in there? Instability. Yeah, it it's because of my pregnancy. Um, I didn't heal well enough for my surgery. And these movements I'm getting into are causing the salt to flare posterior up. Posterior rotation. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. we posterior rotate every time we walk. Come on. <laughs> what, <laughs> what are your expectations? And then the, the tears started. Yeah. I have yeah. to get better and none of the other PTs have been able to help. Um, she works in a busy PT clinic and has gone around to everybody, you know, to like pull on her leg and jump on her pelvis and crack her back and nothing's helping. Uh, uh. So I think I've done myself in. Um, so if I can't, if I can get the pain down and function, that would be really good. Um, but she's really worried that she's done herself in, you know, she's really kind of, there's some self blame going on in here too. Yeah. In your heart of hearts, what are you worried about the most? That I'm going to be permanently disabled and will not be active as a mom and a person. Oh boy. There's those words, instability, disability. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've done myself in. Well, in some ways, she's not doing herself any favors by not taking a break and eating lunch and right. not going to the bathroom. But, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to get her to the point where she can see that she can actually take those action steps. Yes, exactly. And move her forward. But these are important. So these are words I'm not going to use with her. We no. are not going to talk about stability and instability of the pelvis. I'm not even going to mention it. I'm not even going to try to debunk it. I'm yeah. going to work with her in a way that's going to move her forward positively with words that she can begin to start changing this script that she's telling herself about her problems here. Yeah. yeah. And she's complex because she's been to like a ton of people and the, everybody's blowing her off, you know, so... Yeah. Yeah, these three okay. questions really get to the meat, of the, ma the, meat yeah. of the matter. Thank you for listening to the episode. It was a good one, wasn't it? Uh, Susan and I really enjoyed recording this. And as I mentioned in the intro, part two will be released on the next episode. And I think this is really where um, you would want the slides. Uh, the next episode will go in, into much further depth on, on patients from our own caseload. So once again, the, uh, the URL for our slides is tough2treat.com forward slash slides. Thanks. Mm -hmm.